I want to talk about a very exciting new development in the field of nanophotonics, the hyperbolic metamaterials. So what is a hyperbolic metamaterial? Well, it is a material that behaves like a metal for light propagating along one direction, but it behaves like a dielectric, that is to say, a regular transparent material, for light propagating along a different axis of the crystal. Now, we don't usually think of metals as good optical materials, but in fact metals are key to bringing nano into nanophotonics. Photonic devices have features that are at least as big as the wavelength of light, which is very roughly one micron, and in most cases it is impossible to scale them down any further. Metals offer a potential solution to this. The wavelength of light as it propagates along the surface of a metal is in the nanometer range. But light cannot penetrate inside the metal, and it is also typically quickly absorbed. With hyperbolic metamaterials, we combine properties of metals and dielectrics, and using them we can create devices with arbitrarily small dimensions. Despite the small dimensions, they are extremely efficient at absorbing and confining light, and have a number of fundamentally new and unusual properties, such as negative refraction. So why are they called hyperbolic? Well, the name comes from how we describe such materials mathematically. All optical materials are characterized by their dielectric function, which we denote by epsilon and every optical device in existence works by combining materials with different values of epsilon and guiding light through them. The dielectric function tells us how the fields inside the material change in response to the light wave that is passing through. For instance, in air, epsilon equals 1, meaning that as light propagates through air, it is not strongly affected. But for metals, epsilon is typically less than 0, as the free electrons rearrange themselves and try to cancel the field of the incident beam. So how exactly do we use the dielectric function to characterize optical wave propagation in material? Well, we do it through what is called the dispersion relation. The dispersion relation gives the dependence between the wavelength of the light and its frequency. It is a very general concept, and every wave phenomenon out there, from vibrating guitar strings to ocean waves, obeys some dispersion relation. In this case, we can write the dispersion relation as follows. We say that the reciprocal of the wavelength is proportional to the square root of the dielectric function times the frequency. And typically, instead of the reciprocal of the wavelength, we write k, which we call the wave vector. By the way, this simple equation can tell us why it is that metals don't transmit light. For a metal, epsilon is less than zero, and so when we plug it into the square root in the equation, we get an imaginary number. Uh, that makes it impossible to satisfy the dispersion relation, and so we conclude that the wave cannot propagate. Now, there exist many crystals where the exact value of the dielectric function depends on the propagation direction of the light beam. Such crystals are called anisotropic. And this might happen, for instance, when the lattice spacing of the crystal is different in different directions. The way we describe this is simply by writing down a different dispersion relation for each different direction, each one characterized by a separate dielectric function. And here the components of the wave vector k give the direction of the light wave as it propagates inside the crystal. When we combine these dispersion relations into a single equation, we find that for a given frequency and a given set of material parameters, this equation describes a three-dimensional surface. The surface represents the set of allowed propagation directions and their associated wavelengths. In the case of most materials, this surface is a sphere, or an ellipsoid. But look at what happens when the dielectric function along a particular direction in the material becomes negative, like in a metal. The surface describing the dispersion relation then forms a hyperboloid, and this is why we call these materials hyperbolic. Now, a hyperbola is very different from an ellipse in that it extends out to infinity. And remember, that every point on this hyperboloid represents an allowed wave vector. This means that hyperbolic metamaterials can admit wave vectors that are very large, and the wavelength of light inside the material, which goes as 1 over the wave vector, is correspondingly very small, in principle infinitesimally small. Because we can make the wavelength inside the material as small as we like, optical devices can be made much smaller than ordinarily allowed. In addition, the infinite nature of the dispersion hyperboloid implies an infinite photonic density of states in these materials. 
This means that they can function as extremely efficient absorbers, they can also be used for nanoscale waveguides and resonators, and they can enable diffraction-free focusing and imaging. In summary, hyperbolic nanomaterials are new, exciting, have many unusual properties, and could potentially revolutionize the field of nanophotonics. They can be challenging to manufacture, just like all metamaterials, but manufacturing techniques are always improving. Furthermore, some hyperbolic materials can be found in nature. Once a sufficiently good material system is found, numerous hyperbolic-based devices will certainly follow.